Good morning, and welcome to the First Existentialist Congregation of Atlanta. We are a philosophically based spiritual community founded on existential philosophy and guided by feminist principles and dedicated to human liberation and the protection of the natural world. My name is Patton White, and I will be facilitating this morning's Sunday celebration of life. We make our spiritual home in the old stone church, which was hand-built 100 years ago by the African-American Antioch East Baptist Church. We honor their labors of love and the powerful history of this special place. We acknowledge that our spiritual home stands on land forcibly taken from the Muscogee Creek people. We support justice and equality for all indigenous people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our opening words are from Mahatma Gandhi. We but mirror the world. All the tendencies present in the outer world are to be found in the world of our body. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards him. This is the divine mystery supreme. A wonderful thing it is, and the source of our happiness. We need not wait to see what others do. Of course, the only little tweaks I would give to that would be to um, open it up to just not man, but as people change, so does the attitude of the world change towards them. <clears throat> so, this morning we have a piece of music which will uh, just be audio. Uh, we will have a, a visual of Paula's uh, photo to accompany it, but it is an original song by Paula Lark entitled Tree. So, sit back, relax, and listen to this lovely opening song. Don't love God if you don't love your neighbor, if you gossip about him, if you never have mercy, if he gets into trouble and you don't try to save him and you don't love your neighbor. You don't love God. You can say you do, uh -huh. but I know you don't. Uh -huh. You can say you do, uh -huh. but I know you don't. Uh -huh. You can say you do, uh -huh. but I think you don't. Uh -huh. If you love your neighbor, uh -huh. you gotta love God. I ain't gonna sit there. I ain't gonna sit there. 
I want no more. And your soul will be lost. On a Sunday morning, just to count all the angels in the bay. Thank you so much, Paula, for that lovely, beautiful piece. Our speaker today is Paula Lark. <clears throat> Paula Lark, dilettante, autodidact, autodidact, preachy pedagogue. Paula says, I used to call myself a truth teller. Now I simply offer scenarios for reflection and possible reparation. No more a teacher, always an incorrigible pedagogue. I have preached, cajoled, exhorted peace and justice for over 40 years. I banged drums, strummed lullabies, plunked bass, and joked face to face with audiences all over the USA. 40 years of social evolution and devolution now I just observe the madness, occasionally bursting into song, dance, or tirade. Folk generally prefer the song and the dance. Lark is a veteran of off-Broadway theater in New York City, national touring companies of Broadway plays, artist residencies for North Carolina Arts Council, North Carolina Public School Forum Teaching Fellows Program, Riverside Church of New York City, Berea College Promise Neighborhood, ran an arts program five years for refugee youth at Clarkston Community Center here in Georgia. And she says, I am an American traveler, a troubadour, formerly self-named truth teller. Now I am odd observer from time to time offering food for reflection and reparation. So at the end of Paula's talk, uh, we will be treated to some live music, or to some music, uh, original music, I should say, from her and Kim Nimoy. So please join me in welcoming Paula Lark and Kim Nimoy. Hey, good morning, you all. Happy New Year. Happy St. Valentine's Day. Happy Love Day. God is love. I'm Paula. And today, I'm going to tell you something you probably don't need telling. I see colored people <laughs> everywhere. And 
when I was growing up, it was my job to sit in front of the TV, our gray, big old clunky black and white TV, and holler out to the family that would be all over the house, Colored! Whenever somebody black would come across the screen for any reason whatsoever. And back then we didn't have CNN and Fox and so they weren't tramping across the screen all the time with in handcuffs. So they would have butler's uniforms and maid's uniforms. The old fashioned slavery. They come on grinning and dipping and bowing, bug eyed. And I didn't care how stupid they looked. It was my job to holler, COLOR! And Mama and my sisters would come running from all over the house. And by the time they got there, the cameo had passed and it was back to Scarlett O'Hara. But I watched that TV assiduously as I grew. And as I grew, things happened. Nat King Cole, with his straightened hair, trying his best to fit into the European mold that wouldn't scare women into jumping off the cliff. He sang with the velvet tones that calmed America down, calmed the whole world down. And, and, and Marian Anderson was doing her grace notes on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial thanks to Eleanor Roosevelt who said, I don't care what you think. She's my friend. She's coming. She's going to sing. Y'all going to love it. I saw Sammy Davis Jr. hobnobbing with Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and clowning in Las Vegas and I even got to meet him one time. I saw colored people emerging everywhere. Flip Wilson. Bill Cosby. Mm, mm, mm. It seemed by the time we got to Bill Cosby we were already on a downward trajectory with the African American hero because what uh, Norman Lear had tried to do was normalize everyone's fears and work them out with his scripts. Normalized fear of black folk moving in your neighborhood by having Dino Might be brother to a black panther, light skin, intelligent son. I'm getting to the point now. The intelligence that was carried into the media from the dipping and bowing, jet black, bug eyed, stepping fetching, lousy massa. The intelligence was groomed from the lighter races and brought into our consciousness. And the ones who broke the mold, like Sidney Poitier, were the exceptions. And they were stellar examples of intelligence in darker people. And then, and then, Norman Lear caught on to a growing a groundswell of 
humanity that the Kennedy era and, and, and even LBJ with his frantic poverty programs. Bobby Kennedy, Barbara Jordan, and Richardson. We had some giants moving forward in the black-white thing that brought everybody along with them, swept up the feminism movement and championed the Asian cause and championed the Latina Hispanic cause in South and Central America and Gandhi of course had carried his remorse for being a former racist into our consciousness as a dark-skinned Indian man in a diaper who was wiser than the whole world and Martin Luther King and he joined those spiritual brains and we had a, a moment of of peace and intelligence brought in at the same time. Then the intelligence got in the hands of all those freed people. <laughs> we shall overcome turned into black power and then black power turned into F the pig. Meanwhile, the hippies were saying, It's not our fault, it's not our fault, it's our mother's and father's fault. And they were protesting the war. Everybody started getting colored. Because Norman Lear and his ilk normalized oppression and the solutions that we bring to working it out among each other. And he brought up gay and he brought up class with the Jeffersons and all the while black was was going into that consciousness of that generation. Dark skin was was okay. And so it it kind of it kind of caught on that ooh there's some dark people that are doing incredible things in science inventions not just sports that's all they talk about they the big they there is a they that folk talk about they always put the sports and entertainment up there, but we've been making great strides. All shades of people in science and and engineering and, and infrastructure, all the things that matter, health, making money, the main thing that all colors got good at. We freed up the money making. And it's like that. Uh, oh, of course, I can't call his name right now. He said when racism and capitalism met each other, it was love at first sight. Yeah. Anyway, I see colored people now. And if I was given the job of calling out every time I saw somebody of a different race in a commercial, or an integrated couple in a commercial, I could never leave the TV. That's all you see is colored people. And the white people are getting stronger. Because all you see is colored people. They're coming across the border. They're in your face at the DMV. In court, they're your judge, they're your lawyer, they're the CEO. White people are getting stronger because that's what happens. 
when people you fear start getting stronger. You get stronger. Melanin has emerged as beautiful, promising, brilliant. Oh, and there's a pushback. Oh, there's a pushback. Especially in the evil recesses of Hollywood where, oh, we cannot let birth of a nation die. No, we have to have that mentality remain. And so we're going to keep sliding in racism and have it in the mind of the populace without their knowing what it is. So we're going to bring back cartoons like The Proud Family where the dark-skinned father is a fool. The dark-skinned grandmother is lascivious and promiscuous and low moral. The grandmother. Even the Latin man, the grandmother, was flirting with, looked down on her because she was too common. It's the grandmother figure in the Proud family. Penny Proud is very light-skinned. Her mother's very light-skinned. Her jackass door, uh, the father is very dark. Very dark. So you keep banding about that white is right thing so that it never leaves. It never really leaves. It's always there. But I tell you what, it has caused such dismay among the black race because W.E.B. and Booker T. never could get together and people blamed their skin color and it was about money. It was about money. It was about Booker T. blocking people who didn't make black folk just learn how to cook and dig ditches and build buildings. If they taught them how to read Shakespeare or believe in the book, the, the Greek myths, then uh, Booker T told the white people, don't give them money. Black people need to stay in their place and, and become self-sustaining. You know what? That was the truth. Because now what Booker T's talking about, all the millennials and the Gen Zers are doing in their backyards, they got chickens. Making bougie W.E.B. type people the uh, old W.E.B. before he discovered communism. Very uncomfortable because we try to keep our yards clean and these young hippie people are bringing in roosters and chickens and we moved here to get away from that. Oh, the colors are mixing. It's a kaleidoscope. And that's spelled C-O-L-L-I-D-E O scope. All them colors just loose and clashing. <laughs> colors loose and clashing. And they don't know that that beautiful rainbow they are is what is going to save us. Not the Bentleys and the Lamborghinis and the mansions, the bling and the spells you can weave to keep working. The depravity you can embrace to stay popular. The colors are melting together and unless we raise up 
and make all the colors work for the good. Like that scripture that says all things work together for good for those that love the Lord, God, love, and are the called according to his, her, its purpose. All things work for the good for those that love love and are called according to its purpose. I see so many colored people, Lord have mercy, look at them. Thank you.
back to her desk. Thank you so much, Paula and Kim, for all of those riches that you just shared with us in so many different ways. 
Please join us on Zoom immediately following today's broadcast for our meet and greet, where we will discuss uh, Paula's talk, the themes that she brought up, and then also um, share comments about the original music that uh, Kim and uh, Paula created. You can find the link to the Zoom meeting in the chat section of today's broadcast. Next week, Dr. Robert Baker will be presenting a talk, Finding James Baldwin. Next week is now looking to be our last week of regular virtual celebrations of life. The reopening committee of the First Existentialist Congregation has agreed that the conditions are now in such a state that we can reopen to in-person gatherings. We will hold our first in-person Sunday celebration of life on Sunday, March 6th, barring any unforeseen circumstances. So just keep your um, eyes peeled for any further updates, but hopefully uh, we'll be meeting back in person on March 6th, and next week's uh, talk with Dr. Robert Baker will be our final one on our regular virtual series. Um, but until then, I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day today, great weekend, and a wonderful week ahead. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.